morning. After that singing, I almost feel like just saying amen and going home. But I won't. My name is Flint, and I'm filling in for James this morning, and it's a pleasure to be here. It always is. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11 this morning. If you want to turn your Bibles there to Luke chapter 11. We're going to talk about prayer this morning, and I know that most of us here are probably really familiar with this passage of Scripture and the, the one that's similar to it in Matthew, but I thought I would just talk about prayer this morning and the importance in our lives that it, that it has. We're just going to read the first four verses, and if you would please stand with me as I read those four verses. Luke chapter 11. I'm reading out of the New King James Version, just so you know. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that he, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this body of believers. Every time I'm here, I am encouraged, I'm blessed by the life that I see within this body. I pray for James that you would just heal his ear and bring him back here next Sunday. I pray you bless him and Tamara and their family and protect them in every way. Thank you for the good work that you're doing through them here. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless this time in your word. I pray, God, that you would speak through me, that your spirit would fill me, that I would decrease, that Christ would increase. I pray that the people here would have ears to hear and hearts open to your spirit and to your word this morning. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Before I go any further, I want to thank the guy that spoke last week. Is he here? I really enjoyed that. It was really good. And I'm a very critical person, so you... No, I'm kidding. It was very good. It was very good. I wanted to make sure I said that. Okay, so let's just start in verse 1. Now it came to pass as he was praying, Jesus, in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. The disciples were with Jesus for about three and a half years. And uh, think of what they saw. Think of what they witnessed as they walked with him for three and a half years. Uh, they saw his miracles, how he made the deaf to hear and the blind to see and raise the dead. Uh, they heard his, sermon, his sermons and his teachings, and they were amazed at how powerful he spoke, as no man had ever spoken before. They saw his very witness to people around him as the light of the world. They saw all of this. But when they came to Jesus, when one of the disciples came to Jesus to ask him for instruction, it's important to notice they didn't ask him, Lord, teach us how to do miracles. Or Lord, teach us how to be better preachers and how to be better teachers. How do you do it? How do you make an outline? Show us that skill set. They didn't say, Lord, teach us even to be better witnesses like you are. No, when they asked the Lord for instruction, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is the great mystery and the great work of the Christian disciple. In the word discipline, we have that word disciple, and most of us don't care for the word discipline and don't particularly like it. But connecting prayer with discipline is quite right. Prayer is, at times, hard work, and it takes discipline. At other times, it's an easy and moving experience. I, I'm sure if you spend any time in prayer at all, you have those moments where, as Haddon Robinson said, you touch the hem of the garment. You feel like you've been ushered into the presence of God. You feel his weightiness. And when you have those moments, you don't want to leave. You just don't want to leave that place. And then the next day, you can have the same room, the same 
chair, the same table, the same lighting, maybe even the same weather, and it's like you're praying and it's just hitting the ceiling. And you almost feel like you're wasting your time, or maybe I'm the only one that feels that way. And I think it's at those times where God says, I'm here. I'm not going to give you the goosebumps this morning. Press on by faith. I'm here whether you feel warm and fuzzy or not. I'm here. Do the work. Pray. 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 To be honest, prayer done in a consistent and an effective basis is work. It really is work. But it is so important in the life of a believer to have prayer time. Prayer should not be our last resort as Christians. It should be our first line of defense, and it should be the first step we take in any spiritual offensive. For instance, your VBS. You're going to be involved, whether you like it or not, in spiritual warfare. Anytime you take the gospel or try to reach out beyond these walls, you are going to be engaged in spiritual warfare of the highest order. Pray. Do the work. Make your knees calloused. Pray. Look at verse 1 again. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. We know from the other Gospels and from Luke that Jesus made a habit of praying. It was a priority to him as it should be, as I've said before us. Jesus had been praying. He had evidently gone off by himself, and they weren't too far away, but they were listening. At least one of the disciples was listening. And they were watching him pray. And I would imagine, I imagine anything to do with Jesus was amazing, but I, I would imagine watching him pray and listening to him talk to his father, who he had spent eternity with, must have been an amazing experience. I doubt if they heard anyone ever pray the way Jesus prayed. So he'd been praying, and they were listening, and they were fascinated. And when he was finished, this one disciple says, Jesus, would you please teach us how to pray? Implying, would you please teach us to pray like you pray? This is the only time in the Gospels where the disciples ask Jesus to teach them anything. The only place where you say, Jesus, would you teach us this? That makes this instruction extremely important. This unknown disciple didn't ask Jesus, would you teach us about the theory of prayer? Would you teach us, Jesus, about the theology of prayer? In other words, can we sit down and have a Bible lesson on God's sovereignty, our free will, your, his omniscience, his plans, how we fit, how our prayer works. Can you take us through Psalms and teach us the nitty-gritty theology of prayer? <laughs> no, that's not what they said. Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? And I imagine these guys have spent their lives praying. They were all good Jewish boys. They had all gone to synagogue. They had spent their lives praying they had spent their lives hearing rabbis pray, and they had spent their lives hearing, obviously, the Pharisees pray. They heard guys pray. They weren't asking, though, if Jesus teaches a theology, and they weren't asking, Jesus, teach us a technique. How can we say the right words to put God in a box where he has to give us what we think we need? Jesus, how do we have a system whereby we can say the right words? Jesus wasn't going to tell them, about some sort of name it and claim it nonsense, about how you can force your will upon the God who created all and is over all. They didn't want to know that because that's not the way God works. They weren't asking Jesus, Jesus, would you teach us an art form? Uh, how about a ritual? Can you teach us the right nuances? I think that's probably how I would have thought. Jesus, what is the system? What do I do? That's not what they asked. They said, Jesus, we've seen you pray. We've seen these other guys pray. Would you teach us 
pray the way you pray? As a side note, I want to remind you that right now on this Sunday morning in the year 2023, Jesus still prays for you. Romans 8.34 says, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know that we have a Savior who saved us, who saves us, is saving us, who is constantly interceding for us to the Father? Anyways, this disciple says, would you teach us to pray? Because, you know, John the Baptist, he taught his disciples to pray. Would you do the same? We're your disciples, and many of them undoubtedly were, dis- well, we know they were disciples of John the Baptist. He had evidently said, evidently said, I have a way of praying, and he had taught them. And while John's teaching on prayer was undoubtedly good, Jesus' teaching, Christ's teaching on prayer would be undoubtedly superior, right? I think we can all concede that. Evidently, John the Baptist was a man of prayer, and to be a great servant of God, a person must be a man or a woman of prayer. To be greatly used by God, to be effective for his kingdom, it must start with prayer. As I've said before, prayer can be work, and it definitely takes discipline, but it is a necessary work and a necessary discipline. Prayer is important. Indeed, prayer is vital. We must be men and women of prayer if we're going to be effectively used by God. Prayer is so important in the life of an individual Christian and in the life of the church. So what Jesus is going to do in the next few verses, he's just going to give us a general outline of prayer. It was not his intention for us to pray this prayer specifically, these words, when we pray every time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can never say this prayer. And there are some people who say you should never say this. This is, they call us the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer. I'm not saying you can never say these, this prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that, and, and for all practical purposes, this is an outline. This is an outline of how to pray. Not that the words themselves are magical. It's, it's trying to look at this, uh, this, this teaching and apply it through the spirit, through the heart, and approaching God in that manner. When you talk to God, you should talk to your father as if he is your father, as if he is your loving father. And if you've placed your faith in Christ this morning, if you've looked at Christ and you've trusted in him as your savior, then God is your father. He wants you to talk to him like he is your father. Uh, I grew up when uh, I actually just I went to church as a little kid. I was I was in here in my mom's womb and and as an infant and and uh, it was pretty similar to what we have here now, but not quite. But I can tell you one thing that was different is everybody had the King James Bible. Uh, everybody had the King James Bible. In fact, I remember when the first pastor after Russ Waterberg came and he had the New American Standard. And I don't know why this memory sticks out. But it was over in here. This was there was, a, there was a, no the wall was gone by that time. We had a we had a a big wall here. It was cinder block, and so we had this contest for Sunday school. And, you, and it, every Sunday, if, if if so many people came, they'd do an X. And when the X's were full, the idea was we'd knock the wall out, and then my dad would do a handstand, a headstand on stage. I, I don't know why that he did. Anyways, but the the pastor was over here. And the side, doing it like an adult class, and why I was there, I don't know. I was a pain as a kid. But anyways, he was reading out the New American Standard, and I remember this old guy named Ernie Robinson. He had white hair. He looked like Spencer Tracy. But anyways, he goes, in this church, Pastor, we use the King James. Anyways, <laughs> it's a memory that sticks in my mind. Anyways, um, in the, growing up in that, you read a lot of these and thous, you know, in the King James, and, and, and it's beautiful. I, I, don't, I like the new King James because it's easier to read for me, but um, people in that generation, my dad would, you know, oh, Lord, thou and thy, and if you want to talk that way, do it. I, I'm not saying don't, but can I tell you the truth? God's not impressed by that. 
Uh, he's not impressed by these and thous. He's not impressed with you using big theological words. Uh, he is not impressed, especially not impressed. In fact, he's probably irritated by long, windy prayers. He doesn't need you to repeat to him what he knows. Now, he wants to be worshipped, but I don't think when I preach a message, I don't think I need to repeat the message again to God in the prayer afterwards. I, I don't know. It's just a pet peeve of mine. Pray to God like you would talk to someone. He is a someone, you know. Talk to him as you would the perfect father. We don't need to use vain repetition. I shared this in the first service, but a few years back, many years ago now, I was flipping the channels, and I don't know if you're aware of it, but there's like a TV channel that's just, it's all Catholic. It's like Catholic church. And the nuns, there was like 40 nuns in a room, and there's the mother superior or whatever she is, she's up front, and she has a rosary beads, and she's praying through, and Hail Mary. And, and so I sat there very spiritually condemning them for like 10 minutes, and <laughs> Vain repetition. Oh. <laughs> I mean, literally, I'm, I'm telling you what I was doing. I was sitting there like, I've got myself going, what a joke. What a vain repetition. You know that for Jesus says, don't, don't pray like that because you think that heathens pray that way because they think their father's going to hear. And he said, don't pray like that. Well, I was quoting to them Jesus' words. Very spiritual moment for me. <laughs> and uh, the next day, literally the next day, I'm in my room. I'm spending time alone with the Lord and I'm praying, and the Lord just spoke to me and said, by the way, you pretty much say the same words every day when you pray. <laughs> I'm not making this up. It was a very loving conviction where he said, you're guilty, my son, who I love and have redeemed and have adopted. You're guilty of what you judge them for. He's not, he didn't say they were wrong or right. He just said, you are judging them for what you're guilty of. And I said, you're right, Lord. Anyways, God is not impressed with long, windy prayers. And he's not impressed with these and thous. And he's not impressed when you explain to him his word. He's a, he wants you to come to him and talk to him with honesty. That's what this, this is lesson's about. Prayer is a conversation, and to be honest, to be blunt with us, we need to be more honest with God. He knows everything you're going through anyways. Don't come to God and try to fool him and make him, make him think that you're not scared or angry or sad or glad. He knows. And the, one of the worst things we can do is try to put air ons for God. Why would we do that? He knows. You know what he wants? He wants honesty from us. Come to him and say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm mad at you. <laughs> or God, I'm sad. Or God, I'm, this has been a great day. You don't need to sound all spiritual and pious when you pray. Be real with God. One of the, some of the most powerful prayers I ever heard uttered were prayed by a slightly mentally handicapped teenage kid. I am not, I'm not kidding you. And I would leave there and think, Lord, help me to pray like that. Seriously. Verse 2. So Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus said, When you pray, start off by acknowledging who you are talking to. Your Father. Abba Father. Daddy. And that's not said in a disrespectful way way, and there's a song, Toby Keith, Who's Your Daddy? It's not, it ain't like that. It, he's, the, the idea of being, he's your dad. He's your father. Yesterday when I was preparing this, James asked me Friday afternoon late if I could put something together, and, and so yesterday I was working on this, and I, I came up with at least 10 things that gives God the right to be called your father or for you to be able to call him father. There's more, I'm sure. But first of all, he's your father today by right of creating you. He created you. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 and Psalms 139, 13 through 14 speak of that in many other places. He has the right to be your father because he sustains you or takes care of you. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. 
He is your father because he has redeemed you from the curse of, the sin, of sin and the law. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. Here's a real big one. He is your father because he has adopted you. Romans 8, 15. He is your father because he keeps you secure in his family. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. He is your father because he blesses you with every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 3. He is your father because he knows you intimately down to how many hairs are on your head, Matthew 10, 30. He is your father because he loves you with a love that's indescribable. And I can't think of a better verse for that than John 3, 16. He is your father because he knows how to give you good things and he wants to, Luke 11, 10 through 13. He's your father because he knows how to discipline you perfectly. Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. So Jesus says, when you come in prayer, start off by acknowledging who it is you're speaking to. Start off by acknowledging that God, if you put your faith in Christ, is your father. That he's a loving and faithful father. That is how Jesus talked to God when he's prayed to his heavenly father. He called him Father. The idea that you and I, because of our relationship with Christ, are given the same privilege uh, that we can address God Almighty as Father is truly amazing to me. I, uh, when I pray, I like to almost always say this when I'm having my time in prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, you created me. I am your creation. And why do I say that? For me personally, it reminds me of who I am, that I'm not all that, that I'm dust, that I'm finite, that I would not exist had God not created me. You know, we tend to think, because we're sinful, that we are the center of the universe, each one of us, to some extent. It's all about me. And it's really not. We are dust that God breathed life into. And then, by his grace, raised us up with Christ, seated us with Christ at his right hand, and adopted you. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. I think of the angels, the angels, the two-thirds that stayed faithful. I'll tell you, when God says go to one of those angels, they go. When God says come, they come. When God says speak this, they speak that, and their obedience is perfect and immediate. And they watch us. It says they study us. And I don't know if they have conversations or not, but I imagine if they do, they have conversations and say, have you seen that guy in Owaco? Flint. Wow. God is patient with him. And the other angel might say, not only that, but did you know he is a son of God? He has been adopted. He is a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and he will judge us one day. I, don't, I doubt if angels have those conversations, but I like to pretend that they do, and I think that they are amazed at the grace lavished upon us, the fact that you and I have been adopted, that we are children of God, and that we have the right and the ability to come and call him Father. Father. So when we start off our prayer, we start off by acknowledging who it is we're talking to. Our God and our Father. He says, when you pray, say our Father in heaven. So we acknowledge who it is we're praying to. But then we acknowledge that, yes, there is a boundary between us. What I mean by that is 
we acknowledge you are in heaven. Now, we know that God is omnipresent, but Jesus makes a point of saying, when you come and pray, remember who you're praying to and remember where he is at. Why does he say that? Because we, by saying our Father in heaven, this establishes God's position as being sovereign and over all. He is not your buddy. He's not the old man in the clouds. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And if you've been in church any length of time, you know the kind of fear is a more of a reverence. I would suggest that you approach this God with reverence. Amen. With reverence. Amen. He is God, our Father, yes. By grace through faith in Christ, He is my Father. But He is in heaven, meaning He is above all, He is over all. And when you say, Our Father in heaven, it is the flip side to the He's my dad coin. He is God. He is so holy that if you and I were to look upon him, we would die. Our Father in heaven. So we start off by establishing who we are talking to and our relationship to him, our Father, through faith in Christ. Then we engage with a proper attitude of where God is and what God is. When you say our God in heaven, all those things are implied. You're acknowledging who you're talking to and his proper place. He says, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then my version says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We acknowledge who we're talking to. We acknowledge that there is a boundary, a, a proper place for this father that we are talking to. Then we, then we approach with an appropriate posture before our Heavenly Father. He says, tell him, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. Now, God knows he's holy, and he knows his name is holy. So obviously, we're not telling him something. We're not giving him new information. Jesus is saying, this is an attitude check. When you say, our Father in heaven, hallowed, Holy be your name. You're saying, God, I have a desire in my heart that throughout the universe and in my life, your name would be esteemed, that your name and your person would be magnified, that all that is in your name, Yahweh, the great I am, Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. The Lord God Almighty, the omnipotent one, the everlasting one, the one who has been, is, and will forever be, the one who goes from everlasting to everlasting. When you say, hallowed be your name, all of that and much more is implied. Am I saying that when you come to prayer, and is Jesus saying, more importantly, you got to say, hallowed be your name? No, that's not what he's saying. This is an outline. He's saying when you come to the Father, you come with a heart of worship. In essence, this is worship. And this is exactly when I spend time with the Lord praying, this is exactly the pattern that I follow. I start off with worship. I pray to the Father. I say things about him and what he means to me. I also pray to the Son, and I don't know if this is correct. If I'm wrong, someone can correct me. You can send me an email. I pray to the Holy Spirit too. There are, it's, it's one God in three persons. I'm not, I forget, I'm not going to try to go there. I'm just saying that I pray to all three members of the Trinity I tell them the different works they do in my life. I acknowledge them, that, they're, that, that I love them, that I need them, that they are God, and that I, and this is also implied, you are God and I am not. That's a lot for hallowed be 
your name, but that is what Jesus is saying. When you approach God, acknowledge who you're talking to, okay? Acknowledge the, the, the boundary, the correct place of God, then worship him. Worship him. Then he says, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. This expresses a longing for God's promised kingdom rule to appear. I shared this with the first service. Uh, as we see the world we live in get more and more nuts, what a wonderful event at the White House the other day. Anyways, we long, as Christians, we long for God's kingdom to be established. As a matter of fact, keeping our focus on that coming kingdom and on eternity is what keeps me sane. I talked about Lot. I, I, it's weird having two services because you share things and you think, well, that was a good thought. I want to make sure I get that in here. So here we go. I talked about Lot. It wasn't in my notes. And, you know, Lot gets this, you know, he shouldn't have gone down to the plain down there and he shouldn't have gone into Sodom and he shouldn't have been there and all that. And that's true. It says righteous Lot. It's one of the only reasons we know that he was a saved man. Righteous Lot, whose soul was vexed who was bothered by the immorality around him. And I feel like Lot sometimes. It's like, man, Lord. So when we say, when we say, as Jesus said, your kingdom come, you're just saying, Lord, I, I'm looking forward to the day when your will is done, when you, when you rule this earth. He says, then you say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is an expression, if you will, of acknowledging that what God wants and desires is right and should happen. In other words, the first one, your kingdom come, is sort of a broad, we, I really want your will to be done on this earth. I want you to rule. I want righteousness to reign. And the closer I get to, the older I get, the more I look forward to that. When you're young and you have your whole life, and I understand this, I think it's ter perfectly normal, you're thinking, well, I'd like to experience marriage and children and then maybe grandchildren. I'd like to have a career and then come back. I think that's normal. I think that civilization goes on that way. But I can tell you, marriage is wonderful, but heaven will be better. <laughs> Kids are great, but heaven is better. Um, we cling, especially in the United States, to this world. I don't think our brothers and sisters in North Korea or Ethiopia or Somalia have that problem. I don't think a Christian in Somalia wakes up going, I'm loving life. Jesus, stay away a few more days. I don't think so. When he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's acknowledging that God in my life, in my life, what you say is right. And may your will be done in my life. I acknowledge God that you're God, I'm not. Your will be done. So when we come to God in prayer, we acknowledge who we're talking to, our Father. We establish that there's an appropriate boundary between us and the Father, that he is in heaven and he is sovereign over all. We next establish an appropriate spiritual posture or attitude towards God. We, we express reverence for his name and all that that implies. We also express a desire for his rule and his name to be respected on this earth. And we let God know that what you want is right, what you say is right. I don't have to like it but it's right. 
That's all implied in those little phrases. That's why I say this is an outline. This is an, a heart attitude. Jesus says, when you come to pray to the Father, come with the right heart attitude. Then verse 3. Give us day by day our daily bread. Now, I don't know about you, but in my house, and I've shared this before from here, I, I have probably in my pantry and in the freezers and refrigerators. It's probably enough food. I don't know. I last a long time. I have, I'm on a diet. I've been on a diet my entire life. I, I have to diet. So do I need to pray, give us this day our daily bread? Um, there are places in the world where this is very much a reality. Uh, when Jesus spoke this, they were paid daily. It was the, they, you, know, you worked a day, you got your wages. What this is is an acknowledgement of dependence upon God. But let me back up a little bit. When Jesus was in the, in the wilderness, remember, he fasted for 40 days. And then there's that phrase that's the biggest understatement in the Bible. He was hungry, you know. He was hungry after not eating for 40 days. And Satan came and he tempted him. And he said, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, turn these stones into bread. And uh, Satan, or excuse me, Jesus replied to Satan, man does not live by bread alone. Now, Jesus was not saying that we don't need physical bread because obviously we need physical bread. What he was saying was this, uh, that the things of God are more important than the physical things. That the things of God are more important than the things we can see and touch. That the spiritual is more important than the physical. That is another key, by the way, to being content in this life, to being satisfied with the life we have here, is to remember what's important. To remember that this is a very short period. If you live to be 100 years old, that's nothing compared to eternity. So the priority must be eternal and not physical. You know, if you want to know the truth, this podium is less real than eternity. This is, this is going to be gone. This building, this earth will one day be gone. A new heaven, a new earth will come. This is all very, very, very temporary. And all that is in what, that is all in what Jesus replied when he said, man does not live by bread alone. But also implied in Jesus' response is that God will, in his own time, provide all we need, both physical and spiritual needs. God will provide for your physical needs. He has promised to provide for your physical needs. So, in other words, we don't need to do it the world's way or Satan's way to acquire those things. You as a Christian, we don't have to, as Christians, uh, fight and claw and try to climb the ladder of whatever the success is for you. We don't need to do what the world does. As a matter of fact, we should be the opposite of that. God will provide for your physical needs. He's promised to. So we don't need to fall into Satan's traps of doing it the world's way. God will provide your food. He will provide your shelter. He will provide clothing. He's promised. So when we pray, give us day by day or give us each day our daily bread, you may think, well, I have a two-month supply in my house. That's not what this is about. This is an acknowledgement of where that came from. I grew up in an, on, a, on a ranch. And if you grew up in agriculture, whether it's on a farm or a ranch, you know, and farmers will tell you this, ranchers will tell you this, the line between food and starvation or famine is razor thin. Razor thin. You will hardly find any atheist farmers. I'm not saying they're all born again Bible, thump, Bible thumpers, but they are, they are, they, you will very find very few atheist ranchers or farmers because they know the dependence they have on the 
the luck of weather. One inch, two inches of moisture can be the difference between a successful wheat crop and nothing. So when you say, give us this day our daily bread, all you're doing is acknowledging to God, God, I recognize that I didn't, I didn't give me this, this bread. Even the farmer who grew it didn't give me the bread, although he was involved. You provided this food. You provide my job. You provide my clothing. You provide my sight. You provide the breath from my lungs. You, God, I need you. Without you, I have nothing. And it's an admission. When you say, give us this day our daily bread, Jesus is saying, come to God with the admission that every good thing, every good gift you have is from God. James 1.17 says that. Every good thing, every perfect thing comes down from God. Did you wake up this morning and, and were you able to walk? That was a gift from God. Or did you wake up this morning and you could see? That was a gift from God. Did you wake up this morning and have a breath in your lung? That was a gift from God. Listen, your heartbeat is dependent upon God's grace to you, God's mercy to you. Your meal, your next meal is dependent upon God giving it to you. Well, I worked for it. I bought it. I'm going to go right back to the farmer. If you th I'm telling you, the difference between having grocery stores full of food and having empty shelves is about a year and a half of bad crops. We're dependent upon God. Turn, if you would, to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Philippians 4. Starting in verse 6. Very um, well-known passage. Philippians 4, starting in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing... But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Remember how I said earlier that prayer is a great work, and it, it is. But I also said that prayer is this great mystery. And what I mean by that is this. God knows what you need. Even before you ask him. He knows if you need a job. He knows if you need healing. He knows if you need X, Y, or Z. God even knows how he's going to supply that need before you ask. He knows when you come, he knows before you come to him that you're anxious or, or, or worried about something. And he knows how he's going to take care of that too. But he still wants us to come to him in prayer and ask for those things that he already knows about. As a matter of fact, he delights in you as his child coming to him and asking for what you need and even what you want. But he already knows what he's going to do. He already has it worked out. He already knows exactly what he's going to give you. He knows exactly what he's going to do. So then why do we pray? That is the mystery. <laughs> I'm not going to solve it for you today. I will tell you that, that we pray because, number one, he tells us to. That's enough. But the other reason, one of the other reasons we pray is because it helps you, if you come by faith, to not be anxious or fearful. There is something amazing and miraculous that happens when a child of God comes to their heavenly father and just pours out his or her heart to him. I've said this before, but, but having faith does not mean you don't have butterflies in your stomach. Uh, trusting God doesn't mean you don't feel anxious at times. So let me give you, if you go to a doctor and you get the diagnosis, listen, you're human you're going to have fear. You're going to have some anxiety. You can't help that. It's what you do with that. It's what you do with that. It determines 
the right or wrong response. Go to your Father in heaven. Give it to him. When you do, when you release your concerns and your anxiety and your fears to him, you can be lifted above the circumstances. Now, you may give it to God and have great peace for 10 minutes and then take it back. Okay, it happens. Or am I the only one that does this? I love carrying my burdens. No, when you do, then stop. God, you have this. You have this. It's going to be, a, for some of us, some people with the great faith, they can give it to God and they're, they're off to the races. I'm not that way. I got to give it to God and remind him about it. <laughs> then take it back and play with it for a while and then remind him again. But when you finally let go, and what I mean by that is this, when you finally say, God, your will be done. Whatever you decide, I accept. You can, there's a tremendous peace that comes from that. And it's the peace of God that guards your hearts and minds. So that is a mystery. How this all works with God's sovereignty and our will and all of that is a mystery. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what he's going to do. But he asks us to pray. And I will tell you, this is one of these divine mysteries that we don't know. Our prayers change things. I got to share a prayer praise. I didn't share this in the first service at the time. Back in 2001, that we, had, we didn't have, a friend of ours had a foreign exchange student from Slovakia named Tomas. And I had the privilege of leading Tomas to faith in Christ and then spending the school year discipling him. And then he went off back home to Slovakia in 2002. And I had been praying for Tomas since then. And I had been praying because I lost touch with him. God, would you please, because I don't know how to look him. He can find me on Facebook, on the city's webpage and all that. I mean, they, if he wants, he knew where I worked. He can, I mean, if he wanted to find me, he could. And I've been praying. I've been praying for him faithfully that he would grow in the Lord and, and be faithful to the Lord and, and that he would just find me and get a hold of me. Now, I've been praying this for 21 years. And last Monday, I came, I came to work and he had emailed me. And he had been praying for me for 21 years. And the Lord had laid it upon his heart just recently to find me on the internet. And he is walking with the Lord and teaching Bible studies. And I was just, and he calls me my, he calls me like I'm his father in the Lord. You know, I just, and so we've been emailing back and forth. And he's still in Slovakia. Um. Why did God wait 21 years? I don't know. God just, he had me pray for Tomas, and he's had Tomas praying for me. Yeah, I don't know. I find that, I get, I don't know about you, I don't know, maybe you got a big deal. To me, I got goosebumps. I came into work Monday, opened my emails, expecting to get the complaints from the weekend, and that was the first email that popped up. I was like, wow. God, you are so good. You are so good. He would have been good if I'd never heard from Tomas and I didn't see him till heaven, right? But he said, no, you know what? You've been faithful. I'm going to, today's the day, Flint. I'm going to answer your prayer. The God of the universe answered my prayer. Do you understand? He, he didn't have to do any of that. He said, you know, I love you. You've prayed faithfully, and I'm going to answer it today. And Tomas said in his email, I've been praying for you, and the Lord, he just laid on my heart, find him and email him. Get a hold of him. And so I went to the city of Long Beach, and there you were. Wow. Anyways, going back to Luke, I just had to share that. I was so, I was such an answer to prayer, and so thrilling to hear him walking with the Lord. Just was an answer to prayer. He says in verse 4, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So the next part of this prayer is an admonition that we sin and fail God. And this is a request for forgiveness of sin, 
for fellowship to be restored to the Father. When you place your faith in Christ, all of your sins from the past and all your sins from the future are forgiven judicially, if you will, legally. You will never enter into condemnation, eternal condemnation for those sins. So from a legal standpoint, you are forgiven. But remember in the upper room discourse, Jesus washed their feet, and Peter said, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. And then Peter said, well, give me a bath. He goes, no, you've had a bath. You just need your feet washed. And what he was talking about there was, you, by having the bath, you, you've been forgiven, but you need to have your feet washed, meaning we need, when we sin now, our fellowship with the Lord, not our relationship, but our fellowship gets hurt, hindered, blocked. And to get that fellowship restored, we need to have our feet washed, meaning we need to confess that sin to have relationship, not relationship, fellowship restored. So re Jesus is referring to the truth that as you go through life, again, you sin, you don't lose your salvation, you don't lose your relationship, but you lose fellowship. And he says, look, you need to confess that sin. So this part of the, this prayer, Jesus is saying, when you're praying, remember, if, if you're convicted by something, if I speak to you about something, confess it. Don't just say, well, you know, uh, I don't, don't go to God and make an excuse. If he says, you know, you talked to your spouse harshly, and that was wrong, and, and you need to deal with that, you're right, Lord, I'm sorry, and I'll, and I'll go talk to my spouse. In this part of the prayer when he says, forgive us our sins, this is this acknowledgement, this admission that every day we sin, we fail God, and every day we need to keep short accounts with God. And I would not hold them up for a week or even a whole day. When God convicts you of something, you don't got to go fall on the ground and start tearing your clothes. Just pause for a second. You're right, Lord. I, I see that, and I ask you to forgive me. Thank you for your forgiveness. And accept the forgiveness, would you? Well, I don't feel forgiven. I don't care. You are forgiven. By faith, you're forgiven. Satan will say, you know, that was your 10,000th time. No, you're forgiven. He says then, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And notice there, there's an acknowledgement of our need to forgive others when they sin against us. You cannot be in fellowship with God if you refuse to forgive someone. Uh, we're commanded to forgive. Now, if you don't forgive, I'm not saying you lose your salvation. I'm saying you're not going to be in fellowship with God. You, you need to forgive. Um, I ask you this morning, is there someone in your life that you are withholding forgiveness from? Well, they don't deserve it. Neither do you. Well, they haven't asked for it. Forgive them anyways. And forgiving is not forgetting. You're going to remember, but forgiveness like love sometimes comes down to a choice. You young people here, I'll give you a lesson on love. It's a freebie. You're not going to have ooey-gooey feelings toward your spouse every day. Can I get an amen? You're going to, you're going, you, there are times, for those of you who know me, this is going to surprise you, there are times where my wife has to make a decision to love me because the feelings sure aren't there. Forgiveness is very much like that. Sometimes forgiveness comes down, many times, perhaps all the time, comes down to a choice. I don't feel like forgiving them. God says, forgive them. They don't deserve your, my forgiveness. Neither do, you don't deserve mine either. To not forgive a person, I can guarantee you, will make you bitter. And I would suggest that this part of the prayer is just more or less you saying, God, I need help to do this. So you acknowledge in prayer any sin that needs to be dealt with. You ask for God's help to forgive others as well. God has forgiven us so much. How can we withhold that? Same forgiveness. And that's just the truth. Colossians 3.13 says that. Then he says in the next part of the verse 4, do not lead us into temptation. I'm almost done, I promise. But deliver us from the evil one. So the next part, Jesus says, when you're praying, you do all these things, but you need to admit your total dependence upon me, he says. When you pray to God, admit to him, God, I am weak, and I need your help. Please don't lead me into temptation and sin. Now, let me be very clear about something. This is in no way saying that God ever tempts you to sin. He does not. 
James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So what is this verse saying? This is just an acknowledgement. This is just an acknowledgement that we want and need God to help us to avoid temptation. It's asking God to deliver us from that temptation and from Satan. God does allow believers to be tempted. He doesn't remove all the temptations. He does it to test our faithfulness and to strengthen our faith. But this prayer is just an acknowledgement of our dependence upon God. It's interesting. I th- I, this hit me last service. This, no lie. I've never prayed this. I've never, I've, I, think I was reading that in the service and I went, I've never asked you to help me avoid temptation. Keep me away from it. That's going to be a priority now. Isn't that something how God will say, hey, you never, you've never asked me. And you wonder why you flub around through the whole day? Why don't you ask? You don't get because you don't ask. In conclusion, turn back to Psalm 109, verse 4. Two more passages of Scripture and then we're done. Psalm 109. I want to finish with two thoughts. This is one of David's psalms where he's again crying out to the Lord. He says, Lord, do not keep silent, O God of my praise, verse one. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the dis- for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. David once again was like, hey, you know what? I had these people, they're slamming me. All I've done is speak good things about them. They're stabbing me in the back. I've showed them kindness. They've showed me hatred. I I don't know. They're wrong, Lord. And it hurts. It hurts. You know what? It's one thing when you've earned a person's anger, or mean words. You don't like it, but you can at least, if you're honest, well, you know, I kind of asked for that. It's another thing when you know you're innocent. And David says, in return for my love, they are my accusers. This is just an unfair deal. Then he says, but I give myself to protesting. No, that's not what it says. What is it? I give myself to contacting a good lawyer. No. I give myself to a Facebook rant. I give myself to defending my... No. But I give myself to prayer. David understood something that you and I need to know and need to remember. Prayer is not the last resort when all else fails. Prayer is not a weak response by a weak person to a bad situation. David knew that prayer is spiritual warfare, and it is powerful. You're having VBS. You are going to be engaged in spiritual warfare. I would suggest, I would urge you to pray well in advance. Be praying now. Be praying for the teachers. Be praying for the kids. Be praying for your sanity. (laughs) Be praying. David knew that prayer was powerful, that prayer was was spiritual warfare. David knew that, that when God's children pray, he hears and responds. And by the way, prayer is not about getting God to do what you want. Perhaps this is the real nuts and bolts of prayer. Prayer is about getting your life and your heart and your mind in line with what God wants. And it's saying, okay, I don't understand this. I don't even like this. But God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to be blunt for a moment here. Shocking to you, I'm sure. We don't need... In this country especially, we don't need more churches today. We have churches galore. 
We don't need more Bible versions. We don't even need more Bible teachers. We don't need more pastors. We don't need more seminaries. We don't even need more missionaries. We don't need Republican presidents and congresses, although they might help. What we need as God's people is to pray. Listen to me. We are pathetically weak as Christians in this country because we don't pray. You know why we don't pray? Two reasons. Sometimes we're lazy, and sometimes we don't want to be right with God. And when you're not right with God, even though you're saved, you will avoid him. You don't want to spend time with someone who's going to be lovingly saying, you're wrong on this. We need to pray. We need God's people to pray. I'm not saying that pastors, and I'm not saying any of that's not important. I'm saying we need to pray. I don't know how it works, but I do know this, that prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. I don't know what to do. The world's falling apart. Yes, it sure is. Yep, it sure is. Pray. My marriage is in the dumps. Pray. My boss is a jerk. Pray. Pray. You have a God who says, look, I spoke all this into existence. And not only that, I love you. I've adopted you. Would you please tell me what's on your mind and heart? I know, but would you just tell me and let me work out some of these things? Which leads me to my last thought. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse 18. So we need to pray more, obviously. And I, it doesn't have to be hours in prayer. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying take some time. Maybe it's just a minute or two. But just spend some time saying, Lord, I, I, I'm starting the day or I'm finishing the day. I just want to acknowledge you. And I have these concerns. And give them to the Lord. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't make it bigger than what it is. Mark 10, 18, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. So today is Father's Day. And, and maybe you have or had a really good father. Or maybe you had or have or have a good father now, or maybe you had one, I don't know. Maybe you had, like mine, somewhere in between. But one thing I do know, None of us in this room ever have had a perfect father. None of us in this room are perfect dads or perfect grandfathers. And if you've had a father that was demanding and, and judgmental and, and you always felt, and maybe it wasn't even your dad's fault, but you feel like, I just don't measure up. I just, I want to do this. I want to... I want to rope like my dad roped. I want to ride like my dad. I want to, I, but I'm not the cowboy he was. You know what I mean? All that sounds so stupid to you, but it was a big deal to me. I never measured up. My dad never said a thing. This is internal, okay? When you have a dad in that kind of relationship, sometimes approaching God can be difficult because you feel like he's like your earthly dad. I never quite get it right. You're right, you don't. But God's not like our earthly fathers. God is, as Jesus said, he alone is good. He's perfectly good. And because he's perfectly good, he loves us perfectly. He loves you more than any earthly father ever could. If your dad's still alive, give him a break. <laughs> Tell him happy Father's Day. He did the best he could, I'm sure. Or maybe he didn't. If he's passed on as mine has, then I, he's just saying, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to the reunion. Don't let it go. And, let, and just remember your heavenly father it's perfect. He loves you guys. So, he loves you so much. 
He wants the best for you. The best. If you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, he is your Father today. And you can trust him totally and completely. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these people's patience as I rambled on. I thank you, Father, for your word. God, I thank you for your love. How we need your love and grace and mercy and how you just give us those things. You just lavish those things on us. Bless these people as they go out. Help them to have a great week. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.